To begin our program this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Dewey. Daniel leads the Open Philanthropy Project's work on supporting technical research to mitigate potential risks from advanced artificial intelligence. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in 2008 with a BS in computer science and philosophy. He subsequently worked at Google and the Future of Humanity Institute, contracted with the Future of Life Institute and the Center for Effective Altruism, and joined the Open Philanthropy Project in 2015. Daniel will be taking questions at the end for just a couple of minutes. You can submit those through, through the Bizabo app or on the website, sf.eaglobal.org slash polls. And now, join me in welcoming Daniel Dewey. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm the program officer at the Open Philanthropy Project uh, in charge of potential risks from advanced AI. This is an area we're spending a lot of our senior staff time on recently. And so I just wanted to give an update on the work that we're doing in this area, how we think about it, and uh, generally speaking, like what our plans are going forward. Um, so there are four basic concepts that I want to really make sure to drive home during the course of this talk. And if you watch out for these during the course of the talk, I think they'll really help you understand how we're thinking about this area. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways to frame potential risks from advanced AI that can inform different kinds of approaches and interventions and activities in this area. And it can be a bit hard to understand why we're doing the things we're doing uh, without understanding the way we're thinking about it. Um, also, I should mention, I didn't really frame this talk up as the perfect introduction to this area, if you're not already somewhat familiar. Uh, I would be totally happy to answer questions if there's something that I've gone too fast on or something that was confusing. I'm going to be having office hours after the talk, so totally happy to talk more about it. Um, but these are the four basic concepts. Uh, transformative AI, which is like how we think broadly about the impacts uh, that AI could have in the future that we care most about affecting through our activities. Uh, Two categories of risks, which are strategic risks, having to do with how the most influential actors in the world will react to the prospect of transformative AI. Uh, misalignment risks, which have to do with being able to build AI systems that reliably do what their operators want them to do. Uh, and then our strategy in this area, the way we're currently planning on making a difference, which is field building. Um, so to start off, there's this idea of transformative AI. Um, Basically, looking ahead at the kinds of impacts we expect AI to have, we think there are a lot of things that could happen, and there's a lot of uncertainty about precisely what is going to happen. But something that seems reasonable is to expect AI to have an impact that is comparable to or larger than the industrial or agricultural revolutions. Uh, and that, that's intended to capture a lot of possible sort of scenarios that could happen. So we might see uh, AI progress lead to uh, automated science and technology development, and that could lead to a really rapid increase in, in technological progress. Uh, we might see artificial general intelligence, or AGI, uh, which would mean AI systems that can do anything that a human can do, roughly. Uh, and, and that would really change the dynamics of the economy and, and how, the, how the economy functions generally. We might see systems that can do anything that a human or a group of humans can do. So AI systems could operate uh, organizations autonomously, maybe companies, nonprofits, uh, parts of government. Uh, and then sort of looming all over this, uh, or over all of this, is the idea that um, we shouldn't really expect AI to stop at, at the point of human level competence, but we should expect the development of uh, super intelligent AI systems it's not clear exactly what the distribution of capabilities of these systems would be, and there are a lot of different possibilities. Um, so the reason I've chosen this picture in the slides is uh, because it sort of shows like the change in the way human influence was wielded on the world during the Industrial Revolution. And so you can see this traditional set of biofuel usage down at the bottom, and then over the course of the Industrial Revolution, that became a very small percentage of the overall influence that humanity wielded like most of what we were doing in the world, uh, came to depend on these new energy sources. And so I think an abstract way of thinking about artificial intelligence is as uh, um, that this transformative impact comes from AI becoming a really large percentage of how humanity influences the world, that most of the influence we have is via AI systems that are hopefully acting sort of like on our behalf. Um, 
we also think, and it, it's a little bit too detailed to get into, that, that um, based on progress in hardware, the relationship between hardware and software historically in AI development, and based on the conversations we've had with a lot of AI researchers, that it's pretty reasonable to think that this could happen sometime in the next 20 years. I'm saying uh, greater than 10% chance by 2036, because we said 20 years last year, and so we don't want to always be saying 20 years later as, as, as years continue. Um, so this really big change in the world, uh, there's a lot of variation in what could happen and it's hard to predict exactly what is going to be most critical and what kinds of things we might want to make a difference on. Uh, and so our general strategy in this area, we can imagine two different worlds. One of them is a world where uh, transformative AI comes uh, somewhat by surprise, maybe it comes relatively early. Uh, and there aren't a lot of people who have been spending much of their career thinking full-time about these problems, really caring about long-term outcomes for humanity. Uh, and then there's an alternate world where those professional people have existed for a while. They're working in fields with each other. They're sort of like critiquing each other's work. Uh, and we think that uh, the prospect of good outcomes is a lot more likely uh, in cases where these fields have existed for a while, they're really vibrant. They have some of the best people in, uh, in policy, some of the best people in machine learning and AI research in them. Uh, and where those people have been thinking really specifically about how transformative AI could affect uh, the long run trajectory of human civilization. Um, so we see this uh, as our basic plan is to affect field building, try to move these fields ahead in terms of quality and in terms of size. And a really useful thing about this is that if you want to affect the long-term trajectory of civilization, you don't really get to run several experiments to see which interventions are going to work well. So it's really hard to get feedback on whether what you're doing is helping. Uh, so what we'd like to do is start really keeping track of how these fields grow over time so that we can tell which kinds of interventions are making a difference. And it's not a sure thing that this field growth is like the correct strategy to pursue, but it at least gives us something to sort of like measure and, uh, and track to see if what we're doing is making a difference. So this first category of risks, I'm starting, I'm starting with strategic risks uh, because I think this has historically been less emphasized in the EA community. Um, so by strategic risks, I mean risks that could be caused by the way major influential actors in the world react to the prospect of artificial general intelligence or super intelligence or other kinds of transformative AI um, and the way that they choose to use these technologies to affect the world, so sort of the policies and strategies they adopt. Uh, so for example, if you expect this sort of like big curve of human influence in the world to be mostly about artificial intelligence in the future, then that's a big opportunity for different actors to uh, uh, have more influence in the future than they do today, or an opportunity for that influence to be rebalanced, maybe between different countries, between different industries. Um, and so there's a, it, it feels like there's a strong chance that as influential actors start noticing that this might happen, that there could be preemptive conflict between these. There could be arms races uh, or development races between governments or between companies. Um, if a government or company gains a really strong advantage in artificial intelligence, they might use it in a way that isn't in the best interest of the most people. So we could see sort of like a shift in the way resources and rights are distributed in the future. Uh, so I'd classify that as like a misuse of artificial intelligence, uh, that we want to make sure that transformative AI is used in a way that benefits the most people the most. Um, and then a final thing to think about is that if there are these accidental risks, which I'll get to in a minute, these risks of building AI systems that malfunction and uh, don't, like do things that, that don't really benefit anyone, that weren't intentional then racing to develop artificial intelligence could be a big source of, uh, like a big increase in that risk that if you want to spend time and money and resources on uh, making systems safer, that's resources you're not spending on racing the other players for this advantage. Um, so within strategy, uh, our field building activities, what we'd like to do is build up a field of people who are trying to answer this key question of what should influential actors do in different scenarios depending on how AI development plays out. It's important to consider these different scenarios because there are a lot of, there's a lot of variation in, in how the future could go. Um, 
and there are a lot of existing sort of like relevant areas of expertise and knowledge and skills that seem like they're really relevant to this problem. So geopolitics, global governance, uh, it seems important for AI strategists to have pretty good working knowledge of AI and machine learning techniques and to be able to understand the forecasts that AI developers are making. And there's a lot of history in uh, technology policy and the history of transformative technologies that uh, I hope that there are lessons that we could take from those. And of course, there's existing AI risk thought. So Nick Bostrom's superintelligence, uh, things that have been done by other groups in the effective altruist community. And so our activities in this area right now, like how is it going? I think that the frank summary is that we're not really sure how to build this field. Open Philanthropy Project isn't really sure. Um, it's not really clear where we're going to get people who have the relevant skills. There's not, as far as we can tell, a natural academic field or like home that already has the people who know all of these things and look at the world in this way. Um, and so our activities right now are pretty scattered and experimental. We're funding Future of Humanity Institute and uh, uh, I think that makes sense to do, but we're also interacting a lot with government groups, think tanks, uh, companies, people who work in technology policy, and making a few experimental grants to people in academia and elsewhere just to see like who is going to be productive at doing this work. So I think it's really unclear um, and something I'd love to talk to people about more, like how are we going to build this AI strategy field so that we can have professional AI strategists who can do the important work when, when it's most timely. Um, so the, the other category of risk that I want to talk about is misalignment risk. I've used a picture of a panda. This is uh, classified as a gibbon by a particular neural network. This is an, exa uh, an adversarial example. It's a crafted image that's designed to make an AI system make an incorrect decision. Uh, and it's been sort of a recent um, really hot topic in machine learning because it shows the fragility of some kinds of machine learning models that are really popular right now. Um, this kind of fragility is not like a, it's not like a full picture of the problems of, of AI misalignment uh, when AI systems don't reliably do the things that their operators want them to do. But I think it's like a sort of a good, simple, straightforward example. The intent of training a neural network on these images was to get the neural network to make the same classifications that humans would. Uh, and uh, it turns out to not be very hard to come up with a situation where the neural network will just do something completely different from what any human would say. Um, so broadly speaking, misalignment, uh, uh, misalignment risks refer to this situation where we can make really influential AI systems and most of our influence over the world is flowing through these AI systems, but we can't make these systems reliably pursue the objectives that their operators have. So if we see this uh, a similar shaped graph to in the Industrial Revolution where almost everything that humans are doing in the world is going through AI systems and most of the way the world goes in the future depends on those decisions sort of lining up well with what humans want. Um, and it's a, it's a really bad situation if we're not really sure if AI systems are going to do the things we want them to do, if they're going to misinterpret what we want them to do, if they're going to act unreliably when they're in situations we haven't anticipated before. Um, so we've been talking a lot to groups like Machine Intelligence Research Institute, to Future of Humanity Institute, also to technical advisors of ours who are at uh, industrial research labs like OpenAI and DeepMind, and then also to uh, people in academia, machine learning researchers. And there are a couple priority areas of research that we think are really important. If you want to advance the technical capability uh, of building AI systems that reliably do the things that, that their operators want them to do. And those are reward learning and reliability. So re re reward learning is this idea that um, uh, it would be quite bad if we could build AI systems that can pursue easily specifiable goals, like things you can measure in the world, that are like how much money is in this bank account, or how many rewards come in through this particular channel that's flowing back to the AI. Most of the things humans care about in the world aren't easily measured in that way. Uh, so there's this question of whether we can get AI systems to learn uh, tasks by interacting with humans in a way that makes them uh, sort of cooperatively refine their understanding of what our goals are and act conservatively in cases where they have um, a lot of uncertainty and where the, uh, where the impact on the world could be very great if they have sort of made the wrong evaluation of what their operators' objectives are. 
And then on the reliability side, uh, there's this question of we train AI systems in really limited subsets of the situations that they'll eventually be functioning in. Uh, so if we want AI systems to make important decisions in the world, especially if the world is changing really rapidly and dramatically, uh, we need to be really pretty sure that AI systems are not going to function dramatically differently in those situations than they did in, in training. Um, Open Philanthropy Project, uh, we've encountered a bunch of different models and ideas about how hard AI alignment will be. Uh, there are some people we've talked to who think that AI alignment is like really, really closely related to all of the things that we'll need to do in order to make AI systems effective in the world in the first place. Those problems are just going to be solved along the way. Uh, maybe it doesn't hurt to get started ahead of time, but it's not like an urgent issue. And we've talked to other people who think that, uh, that there are a ton of open unsolved problems that we have no idea how to make traction on and uh, that we need to get started you know, yesterday on, on solving these problems. Uh, and there are a lot of people in the middle. Probably the majority of people are, are somewhere in between uh, in terms of like AI and machine learning researchers. Um, so we're highly uncertain about how hard alignment will be. And we think that it makes a lot of sense to get started on this academic field building in this area so that we can, I mean, if the worst case scenario is like we build this field and the problems turn out to be easier than we expected, that, that seems pretty good. Um, so this field building area, I think, is going a lot, it, it's a lot clearer how this is going to play out than strategic field building is. Um, in reward learning and reliability and in AI, AI alignment more broadly, I think that the academic field of AI and machine learning research contains the people who have the kinds of skills and capabilities that we need for AI alignment research already. Uh, and this is an area where philanthropic funding can just directly have an impact. Um, there's a bit of a funding puzzle uh, to do with uh, having all these different chickens and eggs that you need in order to get a good research field up and running. Uh, and that includes having professors who can host students, having students who are interested in working on these problems, and having workshops and venues that can coordinate the research community and kind of weave people together so that they can communicate about what questions are most important. Um, I think it's most obvious uh, how this kind of field building work could pay off in the longer term. Like if you imagine this AI alignment community building up over many decades, but actually, I think that if we're thinking about the short timelines uh, that, that seem possible, this greater than 10% in the next 20 years or so, that if we want to develop experts who will be ready to uh, make essential contributions on that timeline, this is among the best way to do that. Because we're finding PhD students who have a lot of the necessary skills already and, uh, and getting them to start thinking about and working on these problems as soon as we can. Um, so this is an area where we've done a pretty significant amount of grant making so far, and we have some more in the works. Um, there have been a couple big grants to uh, sort of like senior academics in artificial intelligence and machine learning. The biggest ones being to Stuart Russell and his co-investigators, several other professors at the Center for Human Compatible AI, which is based in Berkeley uh, and also has branches at a couple of their universities. Uh, there's another big grant that went to Joshua Bengio and a bunch of his co-investigators at uh, the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Uh, and that's a fairly recent grant. Uh, there are more students coming into the institute in the fall who we're hoping to get involved with this research. Um, with other professors, we're making some planning grants so that we can spend time interacting with those professors and talking with them a lot about their research interests and how they intersect with our interests in this area. Overall, we're taking a really personal hands-on approach to grants to academic researchers in this area because I think that the things that we want, um, our interests and, and the research problems we think are most important are a little bit unusual and a little bit difficult to communicate about. Uh, so I think it's important for us to do these sort of relationship-based grants uh, and to really spend the time talking to the students and professors in order to figure out what kinds of projects would be most effective for them to do. Um, so far with students, the main support that we've lent to students is via their professors. So often academic grants will support a professor, part of a professor's time and much of several of their students' times. Uh, but this fall, we're hoping to offer a fellowship for PhD students, which is a, a major way that machine learning PhD students are supported. 
Um, I'm quite bullish on this. I think that uh, it's reasonable to expect a lot of the really good research and ideas to come from these PhD students who will have started thinking about these things earlier in their careers and had more opportunity to explore like a really wide variety of different problems and approaches. Um, but again, offering a PhD fellowship is not something we've done before, so I think it's going to be sort of experimental and iterative to figure out how, how exactly it's going to work. Um, as far as workshops, we've held a workshop at Open Philanthropy Project for a bunch of grantees and potential grantees, basically as an experiment to see what happens when you bring together these academics and ask them to give talks about the AI alignment problem. Um, we were quite happy with this. I think that people really pretty quickly jumped on board with these problems and are exploring a set of ideas that, um, that are closely related to the fields that they were working on before, but that are approaching them from an angle that's closer to what we think might be required to handle AI alignment. Um, there are also workshops like Reliable Machine Learning in the Wild that happen at academic machine learning conferences, which are com uh, conferences in machine learning are like the major way that, that academics communicate with each other and publish results. They're dominant over journals in machine learning. Um, so supporting workshops at conferences, we think is a good way to sort of build up this community. Um, and it really depends on being able to communicate these problems to professors and students uh, because they're the primary organizing force in these, in these workshops. Um, so other developments that I think you guys might be especially interested in, there's the Open Philanthropy Project, uh, the Open Philanthropy, Philanthropy Project's partnership with OpenAI, which I think Holden talked about a little bit yesterday. Uh, we're quite excited about this. It's an unusual grant because it's not the case that we're just contributing money to a group and then letting them pursue the activities that they were going to pursue anyway. It's like a really active partnership between us and them, them to try to uh, sort of like pool our talents and resources to uh, pursue better outcomes from transformative AI. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It's not clear exactly what kinds of uh, what kinds of results and updates and communications it makes sense to expect from that because it's still pretty early. But uh, I have high hopes for it. Uh, we have funded Machine Intelligence Research Institute last year, um, and we're still in a lot of conversations with them about their particular outlook on this problem and the work that they're doing. Um, there is a collaboration between OpenAI and DeepMind. So this is something that Open Philanthropy Project, you know, isn't, isn't like funding or playing a role in directly. But I think it's an exciting development just for people who care about this area that these two companies who are, are two of the most, well, so OpenAI is a nonprofit and DeepMind is part of Google. But uh, in theory, they could be viewed as like competitors for producing artificial general intelligence. So I think it's really encouraging to see their safety teams working together and producing research on the alignment problem. I think that's just like a robustly positive thing to do. Um, I also happen to think that the research that they did jointly publish, which is about learning from human feedback, so having an AI system demonstrate a series of behaviors and having a human rate those behaviors uh, and uh, using those ratings to guide the learning of the AI system. Uh, I think this is like a really promising research direction, which I'd be really happy to go on about uh, during office hours, but probably doesn't make the most sense in the last five minutes of the talk here. Um, a lot of this research is related to uh, uh, Paul Cristiano's concept of act-based agents, which personally I'm really optimistic about as a new direction in, in the AI alignment problem. Um, so overall, the takeaway here, last year we published a blog post on uh, the philanthropic opportunity that we saw from transformative AI. Uh, and looking back on that a year later, uh, I think that short timelines still look plausible. This greater than 10% chance over the next 20 years of developing transformative AI seems really real. Um, and additionally, we increasingly think that Open Philanthropy Project can make the biggest difference in the worlds where timelines are short in that way. So a major criterion that we apply to the work that we're doing is would this be useful over if, if, uh, if AGI were developed sometime in the next 20 years or so. Um, neglectedness still looks really high. We haven't seen a lot of other funders jumping into the space over the next year. And I think it was really possible given the increase in attention to artificial and general intelligence that this space would become much more crowded. I think Open Philanthropy Project and this community are really still in a pretty unusual position 
to influence outcomes in this area just because it, it is so neglected. Uh, and really, after having done some experiments in field building in strategy and field building in uh, technical AI uh, alignment research, I think tractability looks higher than it did before. It's probably within the general range that we thought it was in, but maybe more concentrated in the high end. Just as we've gone and talked to more and more AI researchers, uh, that we've found it a more... Um, it's been easier than expected to communicate the things that we're interested in to find common ground between what they think they could do productive research on and what we think would make the biggest difference uh, for the future trajectory of human civilization. Um, so this is a continued high priority for us. We're still spending a lot of senior staff time on it. And I think it's a, it's a cause area that, that it makes sense to pay attention to if you're interested in, in like the long-term trajectory of human civilization. Um, so I'll take questions now, and thanks for your time. All right, you've got a lot of questions flowing in. We're only going to be able to get to a couple of them in the few minutes okay. that we have. We've got office hours, though. so Office hours yeah. immediately following this, which is great. So first question, do you think that we should, or if it is even possible, to slow the advance of AI until some of these areas can mature that you're investing in? Yeah, I think this is a good question. It's um, my current guess is that we don't have very good levers for affecting the speed of AI development. I think there's so much money and so much, uh, uh, so much pressure in the rest of society to develop artificial intelligence that the, it's not a place where we have a particularly strong advantage. Uh, in particularly, uh, or in particular, slowing down technologies, I think is quite difficult to do, and it would take a really concerted effort on the part of a much larger community. Uh, but on top of that, I think it's really not clear. I think it's a really open question how much it makes sense to think of this as like a race between two totally separate technologies, which are like capabilities and safety. Um, my experience has been that that like you need a certain amount of capability in order to really do a lot of the research on AI safety. Um, so yeah, it doesn't seem that tractable to me. And even if it were more tractable, I think it's still sort of an open strategic question. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Next question. Given the massive advantage that some one or some group could gain from winning uh, the AI race, let's say, it seems to this questioner that the strategic considerations are perhaps the biggest risk. So how does the field building that you're engaged in help us avoid a sort of arms race scenario in AI? Yeah, um, I don't want to express too much confidence about this, but the way that I current see, currently see the strategic field building work playing out is that um, we don't really want people making up their strategies on the fly in a panic at the last minute. Uh, and if there are people who have done work ahead of time and gained expertise in um, uh, gained expertise in sort of like the strategic considerations that are going on here, I think that we can have much better, more detailed, more well worked out plans for groups to coordinate with each other to sort of achieve their shared interests. Uh, and then also, if there are some groups that we think will use AI more responsibly, or some governmental structures that we think would be more, uh, more conducive to overall flourishing of humanity, I think that's not something you can work out at the last minute. Um, so I see developing a strategy for mitigating harms from misuse or from racing as something that we need these strategy experts to do. I don't think it's something that we can do in our spare time or something that people can do casually uh, as part of, you know, um, while they're working on something else. I think it's something that, uh, that you really want people working on full time. So I guess that's my perspective is like, since we don't know what to do, uh, that, that we should develop these experts. Another question that touches on some, several of the themes that you just mentioned there. Um, how do you expect that AI development will impact human employment? And how do you think that will then in turn impact the way that governments choose to engage with this whole area? Yeah, this is a super good question. I don't have a good answer to this question. I think that... Um, there are interesting lessons from self-driving cars where I think most people who have been keeping up with self-driving car 
uh, like the raw technological progress have been a little bit surprised by the slowness of this technology to roll out into the world. Um, so I think one possibility that's worth considering is that uh, it takes so long to bring a technology from a proof of concept in the lab to like rolled out in a broad scale in the world that there could be like this delay that causes a big jump in effective capabilities in the world where maybe we have in the lab the technology to replace a lot of human labor but it takes a long time to restructure the marketplace or to pass regulatory barriers or these other sorts of um, um, sort of like mundane obstacles to applying a new technology. But I think it's absolutely worth considering uh, uh, and it's like an important strategic question is are there going to be things like employment or things like autonomous weapons that will cause governments to react dramatically to AI in the really short term. So like in the US, the big example is truck driving. Like is autonomous truck driving gonna cause some concerted reaction from the US government? I, I don't really know. I think this is like a question we would like to fund people to answer. One more question I think is all we have time for. Obviously there's a lot of debate between openness and more closed approaches in AI research. Yeah. The grant to open AI is a big bet, obviously on the open side of that ledger. How are you thinking about open and closed, or that continuum between those two extremes, mm -hmm. and, and how does your, your bet on open AI fit into that? So I don't actually think that the bet on open AI is a, a strong vote in favor of openness. I think that their, um, their philosophy, as I understand it in this area, is that openness is something that they think is a good heuristic, uh, like it's a good place to start from in some sense, that uh, if one of the things you're worried about is uneven distribution of power, there's this powerful mechanism of like distributing information and capabilities and technology more widely. But if, if you go and look at what they've written about it, especially more recently, uh, they've been pretty clear that they're open to a variety, that, that they're going to be pragmatic and flexible and that if they're sitting around a table and they've developed something and their prediction is that releasing it openly would cause horrible consequences, they're not going to be like, well, we committed to being open. We, I guess we have to release this even though we know it's going to be awful for the world. Um, my, my perspective on, on openness is that I mean, this is a boring answer. I think it's one of these strategic questions that like you can do a shallow analysis and say like, if you're worried about the risk of a small group of people taking a disproportionate chunk of influence and that that would be really bad, then maybe you want to be more open. If you're mostly worried about uh, if offense beats defense and only one hostile actor could cause immense harm, then you're probably going to be more excited about closedness than openness. Um, but I think these kinds of shallow strategic analyses we need to move past now. Like we need people working in a real way on the detailed nitty gritty aspects of how different scenarios would play out. Because I don't think there's a simple conceptual answer to whether openness or closedness is, is the right call. But well, we'll have to leave it there for today. Round of applause for Daniel Dewey. Cool. Thank you.